What's up guys, this is Steven Malin, music composer for The Screen, helping you to build a music business that supports your family. In today's episode of Everyday Composer Chats, we're talking with video game composer Peter Jones, where we talk about buyout contracts, taxes, and how to sell your music online. If this video is helpful for you, make sure you stick around to the end to figure out how you can also be in your own composer chat video. Hey, what's up everybody? We are here with Peter Jones. He is a fellow composer. What's up everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you're ridiculous, Peter. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I should also mention that he is a talk box person. Yes, indeed, I am a talk boxer, <laughs> just so we're clear. You're ridiculous. I'm really excited to have this chat. So this is this is our first in a, in a new series that we're gonna be doing here on YouTube uh, where we get to talk to fellow composers, you guys watching right now. Um, the whole purpose behind this is that we can have real candid conversations um, with composers who are not AAA composers, composers who are everyday people trying to make a living out of this, trying to support their family and trying to make their way. So I'm really excited to, to chat with Peter today as part of this coaching call. and. Really, there's no agenda other than to to help answer whatever questions you might have, um, with you know the hope and intention that we can help other people along in this process. So, Peter, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're at in your journey. Well, uh, hello, I am in the middle of nowhere, Kansas City, Missouri, <laughs> and uh, just recently things have been sort of sort of piling up just a little bit uh, recently. This good man here has hired me as his assistant composer, working on a game right now. And uh, most recently, the coolest thing that has really happened for me personally, um, if anyone knows the franchise Ruby, um, composed by Jeff Williams and a crew of his, a crewby of his, <laughs> um, recently he actually commissioned me to remix one of the songs for the official Volume 7 OST. And uh, just recently I spoke with um, Monty, rest in peace, uh, Monty's brother Shivy, and it sounds like we're doing Nevermore. And then just most recently, even further, Jeff actually sent me a mix of the ending roll credits to help him along with that. So that and uh, just, yeah, things are kind of kicking off. And so <laughs> I'm glad to be here because uh, for the past several years, I've been just like, uh, really ramping up my production skills, but now comes the business. And I'm just like, ah, where do we start? That kind of thing. So now that we're there, I'm really glad to have this chat. This is gonna be good. Yeah, I'm super excited to have this chat as well. And just to give a little context, um, Peter, I think we originally met, was it through Materia Collective of all things? I think it was made, I, I don't know, I think perhaps by your book. Very interesting. I mean, and this is kind of a point that I like to make to anyone here on YouTube that if you want to start a business, you know, maybe this is the first point of today is, um, man, if you want to get your name out there, do a lot of things. Yes. I'm not saying you have to yes, go yes, be yes, an yes. author and write a book or create a course and do all those, you know, more complex things, but just be available for people. And, you know, I, I don't even really know where necessarily we met, but um, I know that it's maybe for the last six months to a year, we've kind of been developing a, a, a friendship and kind of a business relationship. And, um, I think one of the cool things about this year, um, at the beginning of this year, I got hired to write for a game called Monster Sanctuary, and I knew right off the bat that this is a game that has a large soundtrack, and I just don't have the time or the, the bandwidth to get it all done within their deadlines. And so I wanted to hire a, an assistant composer to help write additional music and to help toss ideas back and forth. Um, and so uh, just listening to Peter's work, um, you know, I decided to hire him. So. Peter, it's so good just to be able to to dive in here today. So enough about me, enough about kind of our relationship, but um, you know, what's maybe how can I help you today? What can I do for you? All right, yeah. One of the most recent topics that got a lot of composers fired up was the whole Discovery Channel thing that was going mm. on. Um, and if anyone's not familiar, uh, in a nutshell, they were trying to do the buyout procedure, pretty much in just how the, it's like, hi, um, uh, mine. <laughs> kind of thing when it comes to music rights you know yeah. you'll see constantly that composers say get your music rights 
bar none, that kind of thing. And if you have to resort to a buyout, you got to upcharge more, that kind of thing. But in this situation, they were just kind of clearing house, and thankfully, they banded together and stopped that. So when it comes to um, buyouts, which is what uh, apparently, um, apparently our gig with Monster Sanctuary, um, how would you go about calculating when it comes to when you have to pick? When it, when it comes to a buyout, how much do you upcharge versus calculating how much you're going to charge when you're going to keep the rights, that kind of thing. If yeah, there's a man. specific formula or if it's, is it just one of those, what's your budget? What's your this? What's your that? What's your this? What's your that? What's your that? You know? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of, man, there's a lot of mindset and, and there's a lot of ways you could do this. Uh, my personal approach, uh, I'm not sure, Peter, if you've, you've been on my website and you've seen that uh, stevenmalin.com slash hire page. Yes. I recommend anyone to do this in any freelance field, uh, especially art, because we have such a, you know, developers have such a hard time knowing what we're worth and, and what our time is worth. So I like to always charge by the, um, by the completed amount of music. So for example, if you were to go to my website, you might see that, you know, you need two minutes of music for a video game which I just have these little buttons on there that you can uh, push and slide. Um, you know, that might be, I don't know, $2,000 for those two minutes of finished music. It really shouldn't matter to the developer how long it takes me to do it. You know, if that's a two hour thing or a 10 hour thing, they don't care. They just want that final result. And it shouldn't, it really shouldn't matter how many, t you know, revisions I do and how many, um, if I want to bring other people on board to help make it happen, it doesn't matter as long as it sounds like the brand that I'm representing and it, it has that end result. I think that is what we're going for. So that is kind of my, my default um, whenever I'm in a negotiation. It's really not even a negotiation anymore. Um, you know, now that I have more more frequent work, people will reach out and they'll say, hey, I, I'm interested in hiring you for my game. And really the conversation is very short and I'll just say, hey, cool. Um, check out my slider here on my, you know, my instant quote, you'll notice that it's $2,000 for these two minutes of music. Um, does that work for you? And usually they'll say yes. And then we just kind of move forward from there. It's, it's not even in, in a discussion. It's not an issue because they're just like, oh, of course you're that expensive and I'll move forward. Um, but as far as a buyout, I, I haven't done enough buyouts to, to you know, claim a percentage, yeah. um, but probably a 20 to 30% increase on top of that. Um, now in this situation with Monster Sanctuary, it was actually, we already agreed to some terms but we didn't write a contract. So this is kind of me shooting myself in the foot. Um, <laughs> I didn't agree to a contract first. Um, we, it was kind of a, you know, a, a word of mouth agreement, which most of the time that's what I do with anyone. I want to, ha you know, have a good conscience about it and I want to do the work and not really have to worry about the contract side of things. But here's a situation where they're, the, you know, this team is the developer, but they have a publisher on top of them. Now the developers, um, they didn't really care too much about owning the rights of the music, but because the um, publishers, it's a very large publisher, they, they, yeah. they needed to have a buyout to move forward. That's when I said, okay, fine. Um, I'll basically keep the rate the same. That's not a big deal to me. So I just calculated, realistically, it's a small indie game. It's not a huge, you know, it's not... It's not Hollow Knight. It's not, it's not Undertale. It's not... But then again, yeah. you know, those games, who knows? No one knew those were going to be a smash hit. So I had to kind of calculate in my brain, okay, what should my upcharge be based on soundtrack sales and based on whether or not I think this has a lot of potential for more sales. So I didn't do anything crazy because at the end of the day, I didn't want to lose the deal. Um, but I kind of started with my base rate and then just went up a little bit, probably 20-30%. Um, I know other composers might say more, um, but at the end of the day, I'm all about relational equity and I want to work on their next game. So it's not so much to me about how much money can I get right now? Because that was, that was you know, the rate we agreed on was, was quite good. And, um, you know, I was amazed that, that an indie game with a big publisher even had the rate that I was asking for. So it ended up being a really solid deal. Did you say that it's not, um, that, that you don't actually pose as many contracts as often at this point or? It just depends on who I'm working with. I think that anytime you're working with, um, a first timer. That's really what it boils down to. <laughs> I, I've noticed this. Yeah. There's been a trend in in, in my work. Um, I think in total, I've probably worked with I don't know 20 clients in my past. I even have a video up about this. 
This is one of the biggest mistakes because these clients are very likely working on another project right around the corner. And chances are they want to hire you again, but this is only gonna happen if you are at the forefront of their minds when they actually need music. Mm -hmm. And there's almost an, ex an expectation that every month I will be contacted at least once by one of these guys or twice by these guys uh, to be hired for something. Um, and that, that's how you know you're in a good spot because um, you've established those relationships over time. But what I've noticed is anytime I have a new client, a new developer, a new filmmaker, whatever, everyone's really apprehensive. And they should be to, to an extent. They don't, you haven't earned their trust yet. And so yeah. I, they usually... I don't ever ask for a contract because I, I know that I'm trustworthy, I guess. Like I know my my speed and all that kind of stuff. But um, nine times out of 10, a first um, project with a creator, they really want that contract just to, to feel good because they don't want to be screwed. You know, no one wants yep. to pay a bunch of money, especially in, in the field that we are in as composers. Um, the more projects you do and the more experience you do, um, the more credits you have, you can charge a lot higher. And, and my personal mantra is I'm always paid up front. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never had anyone that actually has the money argue that. It's, it's when you're at the bottom of the barrel and you're doing like really, really uh, indie games, kids are out of college and nothing wrong with that, but it's, you know, they only have $500 for the entire soundtrack or a film budget that's only $2,000 or something like that. There's these really small gigs, which you certainly can take and you can do, but you got to realize that you're working with people who have probably never paid someone and they've probably never written a contract. They've never um, gone through with this type of process. So they're just like, you know, they're like rereading the contract and sending it back and revising it and revising it and revising it. And it's just this headache. Um, right. So I found that, you know, the higher up you end up going, the less paperwork there is and the more trust there is for your creative process and the less backlash there is to you asking for, um, you know, your rate up front. So yeah, it, I find that it's really just those first timers that, that want that contract. But then usually by the second project, they're like, well, that was a pain. Let's not do that. <laughs> There's no point. You know, I trust you at this point. Well, I've only had one contract breach in the history of writing music, which is pretty good. That's really good odds. Um, nice. And it was a, a it was an indie game developer who promised to pay a certain amount. I did all the work, and then um, this is you know my younger naive self um, did the work, and then he didn't have the money at the end of the day. He did end up paying something just because he was guilty. And he felt bad, but it, this is I mean this is case in point. I mean I've, I will never do it again. Um, you pay me first, and then I work. Um, and my, my personality is I always want to give, 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 and I don't really want to take anything from you. Um, I don't, but that's, that can be a naive mindset of being taken advantage of. Um, but usually when, when I know that it's a trustworthy developer or, or filmmaker, I know that like, I usually just start working anyway because I get so inspired and I want to start something. But usually in those cases, I'll just write a small demo. I'll write like a 30 second uh, little demo that's not super polished just to kind of um, to show that I'm interested and I'm working on it. And then usually within a few days they pay anyway. So, uh, okay. it ends up being a, a pretty positive thing. When starting out, do you, uh, when it comes to the, uh, the legalities, the on paper, exactly how you function as a business, um, do you go in with the personal account or do you go in as a DBA? Your business has, do you go with it straight to the LLC? Exactly where, you know, how do you start on that? I wish I could just give a blanket statement that applies to everyone, but depending yeah. on what country you're in, depending on what state you're in, if you're in the United States, um, it's a completely different opinion. Um, I live in Georgia, and so my the, the legal system to become an LLC or an S Corp um, is completely different than California, for example. The, the general principle, though, is you will make less money because of the taxes in any given year if you are just a freelancer. The, the only purpose of forming a company, forming a, a legal business, a legal entity, um, is for tax purposes and for legal protection. So if those two things don't matter to you, then don't do it. Um, but the second that you step into that world of forming that company, then you're gonna have to take on a lot more responsibility of keeping up with all of your paperwork, your business expenses, your um, honestly, hire an accountant at that point. 
Um, yes. That, that's absolutely, oh, yeah. absolutely essential. So you can stay current on all of the legalities of your state or country. And, and the legal protection side is pretty big as well. And as someone who, uh, you know, I support my family through this business, it, it, it can't fail. Um, it can't crash and burn. I can't have someone sue me for $50,000 and then my company goes under. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's just not, that's not safe and that's not wise and that's no way to build, build any kind of legacy. If I am just me, a sole proprietor, a, a freelancer who does everything contract to contract, work for hire, whatever you want to call this, um, and I die, my family gets nothing. They get zero of my assets. They are tied to me. They are tied to me, Stephen Malin. But if I have a company, let's say 20, 30, 40, 70 years from now, if I want to sell the company to someone else, or if I want to give it to my family or give it to my heirs, whatever, you just kind of, you sign the legal paperwork and you transition, you hand it all over. And so there's a huge amount of legal protection there that is very important. Um, and I'm all about building legacy. I'm, you know, I talk so much about building a business that sustains and, and takes care of your family. What better way to do that than to form a company that can do that for you? What else you got, Peter? Like uh, the whole uh, Xeno Keys channel that I have. Um, last year, it kind of ground a bit to a halt as uh, other things uh, last year was eventful, that kind of thing. And so when it came to actually uploading my stuff to uh, SoundDrop and this, that, and the other thing. And so most recently, I think you talked about um, you know, asset packs, uploading it to storefronts. I feel like if you have written music, you should, it should be making money for you. It's, it's an asset, right? Um, so there are so many ways that you can do this. Um, and the best part of this is, is, is we're creating digital products. People don't usually think about that when you're an artist or a musician. You're just thinking, oh, here's my music track. But it's a digital product. It's a digital asset. So you can actually multiply it. So it might take you three hours to create a one-minute loop. But then that three hours actually turns into so much more. It's exponential because you can stream that track, you can upload it to SoundDrop for free, it'll go on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Per stream, an artist will receive $0.00397, which means about 30%, 40% of one penny per stream. Um, so now it's streaming, making you, yes, pennies, unless you have an audience, which you should be building anyway, um, maybe you'll use covers of, of pop songs and video game songs and stuff to get people to, to listen to your originals. That's one way of doing it. But then you can take those exact same tracks, you can put them in music licensing um, stores. So that could be things like Audio Jungle, Pond5. If it's video game music, you could do the Unity Asset Store, you could do the Unreal Marketplace, you could do itchy.io. Um, there's the game, game Dev Market. So there's a yeah. lot of places, and there's more than that, but those are kind of the top four. Um, for video game music, there's sort of that music licensing. And then there's a third one where you can just go straight to the consumer and you can actually sell them as an album. So Bandcamp is a great place for that. Um, you can just have, you know, pay what you want or you could set, sell it for $5 for 12 tracks or whatever. So you actually have three huge, hugely different places that you can sell your music and make money off of the same digital product over and over and over again. Um, so this is... So it's actually something I'm doing right now here in 2020. Um, I actually hired out an assistant to go through 300 plus of my music tracks that are just sitting there. They're mm -hmm. um, demos that I wrote for games or for films and things that didn't end up um, being licensed or used or bought, um, or it's rejected tracks. It could be version one or version three. And we ended up using version five in a project that's just different enough to be its own track. Or there's times where I write a lot of music and, you know, film music is, is like this a lot where it might be a seven minute track, 12 minute track, but you can really chop it up into five tracks, five one minute tracks or two minute tracks. So that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I'm so busy doing so many things that that's, that is an afterthought for me. So I don't usually just go there and chop up my music and 
put all the, the metadata and the, the tags, descriptions, titles, and all of that fun stuff that none of us as composers thought we would sign up for. We never, th we didn't know that that's what we were gonna do. Um, so if you really hate that stuff, hire someone. You'll probably save a lot of time and money doing it, but if you do have that time and you're starting off and you wanna make a few extra bucks um, with that, um, you can do it. Um, now, one word of caution, if you are gonna be someone who licenses music online and sells it that way, you really need to hit it very, very hard. Answer this question, I think I know the answer, but what did you do with the remaining four tracks that you did not pick? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking you know as well. We put them on Audio Jungle. Boom. So there you go. Nothing you do, nothing you do is wasted. That's right. And that's a big thing. So key. Um, so I just, I caution, if you're going to get into the music licensing space, post every few months, post quarterly, and you'll get something from it. It's better than nothing. But if you really want to make significant income from those sources, then you need to be regularly doing that. Um, so that's kind of the, the catch is with really with any of these things. But if you want to grow something, you gotta gotta water those plants every day. It's not a it's not a fast income maker, but it is a long term. It's a very solid income if you put that time, put the energy and time over time. So what is it gonna take for you to make that transition? Not that it has to happen immediately, but what do you feel like has to happen? I feel like like a lot of people in the video game community, just that when I dropped like Stronger Than You, that one just like set everyone off. I loved it. And so here's one cool thing about us is that I think we're kind of a, like a, here's this person over here and here's this person over here in terms of our mindsets, that kind of thing. Like you have all these organizational things down pat and here I am just like this impulsive feeler type, that kind of thing. <laughs> and here I am trying to, you know, like set myself down and like chill the, uh, like the fear that's in the mind, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, Peter, you're not, a, you're not alone in that. I mean, that's, that is very common in artists um, because artists want to create. They want to make things when they feel like it, when they're inspired. But I think one of the, the hardest lessons to learn as a creative person is how to make a business out of it and how to be sustainable and consistent. But what is one thing that you can do, even starting today, that you could do every single day that would make a significant impact towards that goal? Well, today I was throwing together a template for uh, banking on one of your su the, uh, suggestion of the uh, like Unity asset packs and uh, selling packs online, that kind of thing. And the other thing that I got to do is market myself as a talk box or a lot more. Yeah. So one thing that yeah. comes to mind to me is, you know, if you're going to be writing a lot more original music and you're going to try to get these packs out there, you're going to try to get music licensed. You might not see money immediately, but it sounds like within three to six months, uh, you could really start to see some real income there. Um, and perhaps in the meantime, if you're going to build up a YouTube channel or uh, SoundCloud or whatever, an audience on Spotify, et cetera, um, with TalkBox covers, perhaps it'd be in your best interest to set a schedule for yourself that, hey, I'm going to release a music video every single week on this day at this time. That way you're going to condition your audience to um, just stick, stick along for the ride. And I feel like that that kind of consistency is going to really push you forward and it's going to connect them, yes, to your talk box, but it's also going to connect them to your original music. And it might not be the perfect crossover, but some of, some percentage of that audience will uh, invest in you as a person and want to be a part of that. That is certainly my own story um, in regards to uh, video game piano music, which is not super related to my original orchestral music. Um, mm -hmm but there is some crossover there because people are investing in me as a person. So um, if I could encourage you with one kind of action step after this conversation, I'd encourage you to, yeah, continue writing music and be consistent with that. But also um, if you if you have that passion to make those top box covers, um, do it and, and do it in a consistent way. Don't, don't, don't kill yourself and overload your schedule by making five a week. That's insane. Find a pattern of man. What's when can I consistently every week, um, make one of these and maybe you can make bulk videos and do three at a time or four at a time in one sitting when your camera is already loaded and you can do the editing over the next weeks or something, something to that mm -hmm. effect to where you can already schedule out your videos in advance yeah. and you can work on um, building that audience because it's only going to help everything else you're doing.
Well, hey, Peter, that's all the time we got for today, but I appreciate you being a part of this chat. I hope some of this was helpful for you and of course, everyone watching. If you'd like to have your very own Everyday Composer Chat video with me, just like this, where I answer your top questions, go to stephenmalin.com slash coaching. Link in the description below. Thanks for watching, guys. If this video was helpful for you, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this every Wednesday. Stop what we have